one gun that is heavier is going to have a perceived lower recoil. Technically, the force is being exerted on the firearm the same, but it has to move more weight, and therefore, it's gonna come back slower than if it was a lighter weight gun. What's up everybody, Matt back today, and we are gonna go into a little bit more of a science lesson today on recoil. What is recoil? How does it affect the shooting? And how does it affect our bodies when we're shooting? Because there's an interesting interaction between us as the shooter and the mechanism of the firearm as far as it goes to recoil and perceived recoil and how we handle it. So first off, let's talk about what is recoil. So recoil is the force that you feel when a firearm is fired and you know that force comes because uh basic physics principles so i'm sure we've probably all heard of newton's three laws uh and the third law is for every action there's an equal but opposite reaction so when the firearm is fired and the projectile is accelerated down the barrel there's an equal amount of force being exerted rearward on the firearm and of course the firearm is in contact with part of our body, either the shoulder for a stock or our hand for a handgun or you know pistol. And therefore we feel that force. And it's kind of interesting because just like there's an equal force between the bullet going forward and the firearm coming backward, there's an equal reaction between the firearm coming backward into us and us pushing forward into that firearm. So all these forces have to balance. And that's where we get that sensation of recoil. Uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, when you have a, a hang on like this, that bullet is sitting at rest. And again, Newton's first principle is that an object at rest tends to stay at rest, an object in motion tends to stay in motion. So there has to be a lot of force that's exerted onto that bullet in order to have the projectile, you know, actually get to the velocities that we see as useful in the short distance of the barrel, you know. Uh, so there's an equal amount of force being exerted rearward on the firearm. Now, in movies, we see you know guys who are, are shot, hit by bullets, and they fly around. And of course, that, uh, that doesn't really happen. Uh, if that were to happen, then theoretically, you firing it would also throw you to the ground. Uh, why is it that that does not happen? Well, so you have to consider the fact that the force is acting on something that is very small weight. You know, uh, you know obviously, we normally talk about bullet weights in grains. But uh, if you were to think about the fact that, uh, you know, a 123 grain 7.62 projectile is roughly a quarter of an ounce, it's, it's a very minuscule amount of weight compared to the weight of a normal uh, firearm or a human body, you know, uh, AK, typically somewhere around say eight pounds, uh, you know, you're looking at an AR-15, it's a little bit less, typically something around, you know, six to seven pounds, depending on how you accessorize it. But, you know, comparing the weight of the projectile going forward, that force flies very, very fast. When you compare it to the weight of the firearm in it pushing backward, it's much, much slower because it's moving so much more weight. Uh, so that's the kind of basic physics principles involved with recoil. Uh, let's talk about, you know, how recoil kind of affects firing of a gun. Uh, so first off, you know, we have these two pistols here. Uh, and one thing that can change the effect of recoil when you're firing it is how it interacts with your body. So this is a very traditional looking revolver and you can see when I grip it how high above my arm the barrel is. So this is what we would call high barrel axis and the reason why bore axis or barrel axis is important is because the force is coming directly back. Now if it's not coming back in line with my arm then we're gonna see things happen where uh, different points will act as a natural fulcrum to turn how the force comes in. So that's where you get the kind of the breaking of the wrist when it's fired, because that force is coming back up here and your wrist is trying to come back in line with it, but because it's so much higher, it causes that break of the wrist. Uh, a really easy kind of demonstration of that. Imagine you're holding something like this, and this is obviously kind of a lever, right? If you were to push on the bottom of this lever, you're not gonna have as much torsion to like twist in your wrist than if you were to push on the top. It's going to turn your wrist so much easier pushing on the top than if you're pushing on the bottom. That's the nature of a lever. So similarly, 
if the force is very high above your, your arm when you're firing, then it's going to help break that wrist. And if you try to keep your wrist locked, wrist locked is going to probably have you break at the elbow. Um, so that's one of the reasons why you feel the effect of recoil in that way. The Chiapa Rhino is an example of an attempt to alleviate the felt effect of that recoil by bringing the barrel down so it's got a low bore axis and you can see how much, you know, it fires off the bottom cylinder instead of the top cylinder. So you can see how much lower that is and it brings it much more in line with my arm when firing. So that allows the force to come directly back into my arm better and therefore I should have less of a snap up because it's able to push directly into my shoulder through the arm. So that's a fantastic example of how firearm design can change the felt effect of recoil. If these two things were firing the same projectiles, the same loads, the same bullet weights, the same velocities, and the firearms weighed approximately the same, then the recoil itself would be the same, but the felt effect of it would be different. Um, that's another great example of how different firearms will have different effects of recoil, is one gun that is heavier is going to have a perceived lower recoil. Technically, the force is being exerted on the firearm the same, but it has to move more weight, and therefore, it's gonna come back slower than if it was a lighter weight gun. Another thing people do is try to spread that recoil force over a period of time. So obviously, the acceleration of the projectile down the bullet, again, is very, very fast. We, it would be very painful if the gun was accelerating into you at that speed. Luckily, again, because the, the firearm is so much heavier, it's going to, to you know, move slower. So one thing people do is to try to spread out the effective recoil onto the person. This could be something like rubber grips or a rubber butt pad, where it has to, the force has to act to condense that rubber, and therefore it spreads out the reaction into the body. Um, also, it's one of the reasons why people say that gas-operated shotguns are softer shooting than, say, a breech-loading shotgun, uh, like a double barrel or like a bolt-action rifle. And that's because, you know, when you have solid connections where, you know, nothing inside the firearm can move, that all that force gets just transitioned directly back into you in a straight line. But once we introduce moving parts into the equation, uh, there's, there's an ability to slow down how fast all of that force is coming back. Because, you know, first you have the reciprocation of just say the bolt carrier. And then that also transitions into the full rifle. And then as that bolt carrier reaches the end of travel and goes back forward, there's actually a force that's working in the opposite direction. So it's not that the force itself is actually any less, but because it's being able to be spread out over a much longer period of time, even if that time to us would seem very short, it's way, way, way longer than the acceleration of the bullet down the barrel. Uh, and therefore you feel the effect of it less, even though the forces are the same. For a really practical demonstration of the, the you know, impact that this has, we're actually having a whole video on the effects of low versus high bore access pistols coming up pretty shortly. So definitely keep out for that. You'll be able to see the difference. And I think you're gonna be kind of surprised at how much it makes. Now, when we look at long guns, again, there's several features that may change how the effect of recoil is felt. A great example would be how inline the stock is with the bore. So, you know, here on this AR-15, you can see that this buttstock is basically directly in line with the bore. In fact, if we were to draw a straight line across, it probably comes in right here, which is good because when you think about shouldering the AR, you know, you don't have the top all the way down here. You know, the top's kind of at the top of the shoulder socket. And so this is putting the line of, of the force coming straight into the shoulder. And that's gonna help because again, you know, you're having that force come straight into you. Now, because you're still shooting on one side of your body, that's where we get the impulse to kind of, as a left-hander, go up and to the left because my body's trying to pivot with the force. Um, there's more mass below the force coming into my shoulder than above it. And there's more mass to the right side of the force than to the left. And therefore, the recoil force naturally shoots, turns for me as a left-hander up and to the left. For right-handers, it's the exact opposite, basically. You know, you're gonna be shouldering it and you would go up and to the right. This is why muzzle brakes are designed to generally channel the gases up and to the right for a right-handed person because you're counteracting that natural turning of your body caused by the force of recoil 
interacting with you. So you can see there, there's kind of multiple pivot points. You know, your, your whole center of mass is a pivot point, turning you side to side. And then also because the weight is below instead of above, it generally comes up. But that can be accentuated with different firearm design. So for many, many AKs, you end up with stocks like this, even if they're made of wood, where the stock drops down. Now the problem with that is kind of like with a high bore axis pistol, that means that the force is above the stock. And that means that this gun is want to climb more because the force is already above where it's in contact with your body. So just like the lever we demonstrated earlier, the higher the force is and compared to the point of contact, the easier it's gonna be for that to, to kind of turn the lever, right? So that means that a stock like this, you're going to probably perceive the effects of recoil. Now you might not feel it as a harder push against your shoulder. It may just be that when you shoot, you'll notice that it goes up higher or it's harder to keep the muzzle down. So, you know, obviously I'm a big fan of the AK design. The, the fact that stocks on many of these do angle down is one of the reasons why some people find them less pleasant to shoot. Uh, you know, you do have a heavier projectile and even though it's not going as fast, if we look at for, uh, the acceleration or velocity times the mass of the bullet, it's actually gonna have more energy in this projectile. Uh, again, you have a much heavier bolt carrier, so the reciprocating mass in this is heavier. The whole firearm is heavier. And then, you know, again, the stock is usually down below the axis of the action where the force is gonna come back. So all of these things, you know, add up to either higher actual recoil or a higher perceived recoil. Um, which is one of the reasons why some people, you know, don't like shooting the 7.62 cartridge as much as say a 5.56. Some things do counteract that though. So this one, it just has a muzzle nut, but the very simple design of an AK slant muzzle brake is, is actually very effective. So again, you know, typically you'll see that they're cut at 45 degree angles and that's so that it channels that, that gas is escaping the barrel behind the bullet up and to the right, which for a right-handed user, is exactly what you need to help counteract that muzzle rise, especially when you add in the fact that, you know, the, the stock is already going to make it want to kind of climb more. So both of those are examples of how the design of a firearm may affect the effects of, you know, the felt effects of recoil. Um, again, you know, when you look at an AR-15, you see that it's got usually a nice butt pad, uh, many, many AKs. Uh, either have a metal butt plate like this, or even if it's a wood stock, it'll have a metal butt plate on the end of it. Uh, meaning that there's no compression there to help take up some of those forces and spread it out over time. You're gonna get it directly into the shoulder. So yeah, um, you know, recoil is something that we all contend with as shooters, and so it's important to learn how to manage it. Uh, one thing that I think is uh, a good example is, let's say you were shooting a rifle and you are finding that it is, you know, you're, you're unable to control the recoil as well. One thing that you can do is try to move it slightly into the center of your body. The closer it is to the center of mass in a line down your body, the less it's going to turn you. So instead of having it all the way out here on the shoulder, try to bring it in onto the upper part of your chest, kind of the top of your pec. And in doing that, because it's closer to the center of your body, you should be able to more easily control the recoil because that force is coming back more directly into your body. Um, you know, if you if you would want to, uh, you know, you can get like a riser so that the sight sits higher and you can try to drop the rifle a little bit lower while still maintaining a sight picture. Uh, again, because you're putting more mass above where the force is entering your body, that should help you control some of the rise. Getting a good muzzle brake. Again, you know, you're not reducing the recoil exactly. Uh, what you're doing is you're channeling the gases as they escape you know, outside of the barrel into a direction that's different uh, so that it can counteract the effects of recoil. And you can see this in some really cool ways. Uh, if you've ever seen the muzzle brake of a 50 BMG, they usually have these big Chevron brakes and they're channeling the gases backwards. And that's of course because you have so much recoil coming back from that large cartridge that it's actually act acting almost as rocket engines to the rear to help kind of pull the rifle forward from the front end. Uh, there's a really weird kind of design. Uh, it's, it's kind of old, it's called a recoilless rifle. And what's interesting about a recoilless rifle is that they actually have perforations in the chamber of all places. Uh, this allowed, when the, the shell was fired, this allowed propelling gases to escape through the chamber and out of vents in the rear of the rifle. 
Now, when I say recoilless rifle, if you're not familiar with the concept, I'm sure we can probably put up a, a picture of one, but this is not a rifle you would pick up and shoulder. This is something that would be attached usually to like a Jeep or some other vehicle. And it's kind of a replacement almost for uh, light artillery. Now, it doesn't have quite the range of light artillery because you are venting some of those propellant gases. But what's really cool is that it effectively has no net recoil uh, when the gun is fired because of all the venting of those gases rearward, the rifle itself just stays still. And that means you can go with a much lighter mount on a much lighter vehicle than if you were to use a cannon of that same kind of size where you know you would have to have very large you know springs if not like kind of a hydraulic uh, recoil systems to accept all of the recoil of those gases. So guys, I appreciate you coming along with me on this discussion of recoil and how gun design can affect the felt effects of recoil on the human body and how we as shooters can kind of learn how to mitigate recoil. I mean, certainly there's so much that goes into this topic. The science of it isn't super complicated, but you know, there's, there's so many different factors. And I think that it's very interesting when you see new designs like the Rhino that come out trying to uh, address it in a unique new way uh, from previous, uh, previous designs. Uh, guys, remember, we do still have our giveaway going on. So that's the FN uh, 249S para model. It comes with the EOTech site. And of course, you have the drum here for the, or the carrying case for the linked ammunition, 5.56 five, caliber. It's got the collapsing para stock. It's a super cool thing. 13 and a half inch barrel pinned to 16 inches with this cool uh, muzzle extension here. Uh, I mean, it's a little, little, you know, kind of... Uh, transporty boy for uh, guys who you know are in and out of vehicles or jumping out of airplanes, but you have the semi-auto only version that you're gonna be able to take home, which would be one heck of a Christmas gift, I tell you what. Um, I wouldn't mind taking that home, but uh, one of you lucky guys will get to take it home. Again guys, we really appreciate you coming down to Classic Firearms. I really like this kind of conversational where we just talk about a topic style of video. So if you like this, let me know some topics below. I'd be happy to look at your suggestions, see maybe what we can do in the future. And, uh, and yeah, we always appreciate your business. God bless.